this is a topic that I'm pretty passionate about. Um, just sort of the neurological people with neurological dysfunctions and how mm -hmm. we can serve them. And um, I think that in the Pilates world, we can make a really big difference for this population. So, um, so I'm really excited to share this with you. Yeah. Um, for today. Uh, yeah. We've had several clients that, um, have multiple sclerosis and, um, other neurological, um, uh, conditions that, um, okay. that, any information is valuable. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'll tell you this, this one today that I'm focusing on is not multiple sclerosis, although I think a lot of the same, when we talk about neurological dysfunction, a lot of the same applications are relevant across the board. The impetus for this was actually because we had a lot of clients, I'm also a physical therapist, we had a lot of clients coming in with um, more and more neurological issues. Uh, one of the big ones is ALS that we've been seeing. Um, mm -hmm. Also concussions and traumatic brain injury and then um, brain tumors I've been seeing. So uh, the, the main differences I think, and, and then I, I'll, because we were seeing so many of these types of people, uh, I, I do a lot of teaching. Um, I love teaching. So I put together a neuromuscular, we call it the neuromuscular connection class um we and i we are sort of towards the end of that course now and this is one of the cases that we studied in that course so um what i'll do is i don't always have a huge presentation for this but i just put together some of the pieces just to see if i could help make it more clear as to what the picture looks like and then i can tell you some of the things that we've been doing and then i'd love to hear your input and see if we can, as a group, sort of answer some questions and maybe help come up with some ideas that could be more relevant to what you're seeing in your studios and clinics. Let me dive in here. So I put this page up more because I think it's always good to have sort of a framework to think about when you think about a case study. I sort of go through this process all the time in my head. Um, so I, we don't have to specifically answer these questions, but they just could give us a little bit of a guideline. So basically what I like to think about is, first of all, what is my concern with this person or what would the problem list be for that person? And that could be what, what are their goals? Why are they even coming in? Um, and then what are we most concerned about? They might have goals like, I want to climb a mountain, but um, maybe in this case, they're not even walking upstairs yet. So our concern might be getting them functionally safe and then getting them stronger so that they can eventually climb up that mountain. That would be fantastic, right? Um, so just to think about what the concerns of that person or the problem list might be, uh, then also like to think about what the potential contraindications might be for that person. Um, and then I always try to focus on what those contraindications are right up front so that I don't fall into the what uh, fall into kind of my routine and those exercises that I always do that may not be right for this person. And in the neurological realm, it's a little bit different. And we can talk about that too. And then three exercises I might avoid. Um, and then what are the four best exercises that you can think of for the person to help alleviate symptoms or to help progress them towards their goal? Uh, and here I always try to remind myself that I get to spend, if I'm lucky, I get to spend two hours, three hours a week with the person that's coming in. Uh, and so I don't wanna fiddle around with things that are less about, I wanna create value in that session of that, it's such a short blip in their week, you know, the amount of time I get to spend with them. So I like to try and think about what the best exercises might be that I could do in that time I have with them. And then what, what kind of that exercise progression might look like. So do I want them standing? Do I want them sitting? Do I want them uh, supine prone? Kind of where do I want this person and how am I gonna progress them here? So those are just some, a little bit of a framework. And so I'll introduce you to my case study. This is an interesting one because this is actually a client of mine that I'm still seeing. Um, and what we talked about, so she has a brain tumor um, we, and we talked early on, um, I've been working with her for years. She's become a really good friend. And we talked about having her write down her experience 
as she could. So she actually started writing kind of a little bit her experience. So these are her words in the first few slides. And I, and I wanted to just keep it as is so that you could hear it from her, um, her experience. So um, I'll just read it out loud, um, kind of word for word. So sorry about that, but I just feel like it, it sounds great. You can really hear her coming through here. So she says, I have been experienced, had, ex uh, I have had experience, I have been experiencing numerous cognitive symptoms for many years, such as headache, fatigue, executive functioning, decline, and memory loss. They had been dismissed by doctors as age, hormonal, or stress related. And she's 45 right now. Then I started having some sensory motor symptoms on my right side, weakness and numbness. I was tripping or stumbling more and more. A few years ago, I had a fall and separated some ribs on my right side while on a step ladder. I just thought I was clumsy. A year later, I tore my right calf muscle, simply leaning over to kiss my son on the top of his head when I came home from work. In 2021, I really began, began noticing weakness and sensory changes. I wasn't able to move my right foot as far or as fast as the left one. My right foot and lower leg were feeling increasingly numb and my right hand and forearm were beginning to feel numb as well. On June 30th, I was walking on a trail near my house with a friend and my leg from mid thigh down and foot suddenly stopped working for a couple of minutes and was really numb. As soon as I could walk again, we walked home and I immediately contacted my doctor's office via video visit, asking if I might have, it might have been a sign of a heart attack or stroke or if I should go to the emergency room. They didn't think so, but asked me to come in for an exam that afternoon. The nurse practitioner who saw me referred me to see a neurologist and seek diagnostics within two weeks, but that was impossible as every neurologist I contacted was booked out for six weeks or longer. When I asked what I should do if it happened again, she advised me to go to the ER. I made appointments with a couple of neurologists and asked to be contacted in case an appointment became available, hoping I could be seen sooner. I was able to get an appointment for a consultation at an imaging center about a month later for diagnostics. The doctor there gave me an exam and assured me he, I didn't have to worry about any of the big stuff. He thought I had a perineal palsy and carpal tunnel since my symptoms didn't fit with other diagnoses he could think of. He suggested a nerve conduction study. I got the shock of my life when I answered the phone on a Thursday this fall. It was a call informing me that the MRI I had had the day before revealed a large mass called a meningioma, a brain tumor of the meninges, which is one of the protective layers surrounding the brain in the left frontal lobe. The doctor told me as far as brain tumors are concerned, this was the best kind to have as they are typically slow growing and the majority are benign. There was an additional complicating factor. It was severely compressing the superior sagittal sinus, which is a blood vessel that runs through the center of the brain. The following Monday, I met with a neurosurgeon and a week after that, I was in the operating room. I was fortunate enough to be referred to one of the best neurosurgeons in the world who happens to specialize in this type of tumor and the parts of my brain that were being impacted. He told me if we had had images of my brain from 10 to 15 years before, we would have likely been able to see the tumor in its early stages. So that to say that um, the tumor was probably growing for 10 to 15 years. And the, she, we had a longer discussion about it. She um, talks about how now in retrospect, she can put back together all these pieces of signs and symptoms and things that were going on that we didn't put together or she didn't put together. I didn't put together. I was the one who treated her for her Achilles tear. Um, I treated her after she fell off the step ladder, which was such a strange event. She, we explained it away by having her, by her, uh, she thought maybe she didn't lock the stepladder properly. And so it got off balance while she was on it and she fell. Um, and then she started having more mental issues, which she really kept to herself, kind of that brain fog, thinking maybe she's premenopausal or something like that. Um, the memory, but they thought it was stress related. Um, the pieces never really came to her. So here is um, the MRI pictures. And you can see, like, I, I actually cried when I saw this. This is um, pre-op, right? That's the tumor. It's huge, right? Um, so here it is. And you can see that it's pressing on this, um, the sinus here. Uh, and that the, the problem with that 
uh, is that they can't, it's very dangerous to extract around the blood vessel because they could break the blood vessel and that could cause like a stroke or um, blood on the brain type of thing um, and, and cause a worse situation. Luckily, none of that happened. So, um, let me just see what we have here. So, here, um, I'll give you a little bit. So, the tumor that she had was causing weakness in the right side of her body because the pressure was on the motor cortex on the left side of the brain. After surgery, she lost more function in the right side, completely losing the ability to activate her right leg. She had increased weakness in her right arm and a significant increase in fatigue. She also presented with difficulty of concentration, increased memory loss. Um, fortunately, in her case, the tumor was benign. Unfortunately, because of the location, the surgeon was not able to extract all of it. So she's now on a six week course of radiation five days a week for six weeks straight. She is now, she will be finishing that at the end of February. So she's in the process right now. This here is um, just saying after surgery, she had that increased loss of function, especially in the right lower limb. She went to a neuro rehab facility where she did physical therapy, occupational therapy and speech therapy in the hospital twice a day each. So they really tried to get her back on track. She was able to leave a rehab facility 10 days post-op with an AFO and a cane. Um, an AFO, if you don't know what that is, it's like a plastic brace that goes under the foot and up the back of the leg. So pretty high up, so close to the back of the knee. And the purpose is to keep the foot in a dorsiflexed position. And while um, we, we do that when people don't have enough strength or nerve information to dorsiflex the foot so that they can walk without tripping over their toes, right? So we could put them in an AFO, the AFO slides into the shoe and really helps walk. So she um, came out of the hospital with an AFO on her foot and a cane or walker just based on what, I think she came home with a walker and then progressed to the cane just after that. And then this, she sent me this uh, video. This is two weeks post-op. So she came out. The reason that she had increased loss of function was basically the trauma that the surgery caused her, her brain um, she, and the inflammation around the area. So as her brain started healing, she started making more and more progress. That was exciting. I got to work with her and see her making all that progress. Now the radiation is causing um, inflammation in the brain and she's having a decline in function because now there's pressure again from the inflammation on the areas of her brain, on the motor cortex, basically. So it, the main issue is uh, she's having uh, less coordination with the foot again, more difficulty moving the foot. And she's having a lot of, a lot more fatigue again. Um, and her arm, I think, is okay for the moment. We haven't focused as much on that just because we're more focused on making sure she's safe moving around the house. But I have a little video. This was two weeks post-op. She was just starting to get some function back. My engaging my leg muscles to help this, but look. <laughs> Thank you. So she's basically saying that she was engaging all her leg muscles, every muscle in her leg to make that little tiny motion happen um, into plantar flexion. And she was just super grateful that she was able to do it. Kind of just so you can see the motion one more time here. So she's just getting a very tiny bit of plantar flexion, which is exciting because it was telling us that there's some healing taking place and that there is some connection happening that she is getting, her brain is starting to be able to communicate with the muscles in her foot again. So that was sort of the first waking up of the foot um, that she had. So I thought I would share that as well. And then here is um, the current status. So she was able, Gina was able to regain most of her motor function after surgery still had some difficulty with dorsiflexion of the right foot, even at the best that we got before the decline started from the radiation inflammation. She was also starting to regain some energy. And uh, for those of you who don't know, with the brain trauma, any sort of brain trauma uh, causes a ton of fatigue. So people who have any sort of brain injury or 
they need to sleep and rest and shut off. Not screens are really hard for them. It's really hard for them to stay focused and concentrate. So, um, so here she was uh, starting to regain energy. Energy. Now the radiation is causing more inflammation, and she's seeing a reemergence of the weakness, difficulty with concentration, increased fatigue. And then she'll complete that radiation at the end of February. Her goal is to get strong enough to hike in the mountains. Okay, so that's a big case. Do you guys have any questions on that? Any more information you would want to get out of that? I'm just curious why they're doing the radiation if it's benign. Oh, great. Okay, that's a great question. And not being a neurologist, I can only give you my my opinion as in terms of what I think they're doing uh, and what I understand it to be. So the the tumor is um, benign, um, meaning it's not a cancerous tumor, but it is nonetheless putting pressure on the areas of her brain. So, and it's a slow growing tumor, which is why her symptoms were so gradually onsetting that they couldn't catch it earlier on. But if they leave tumor tissue in there with, that they couldn't extract, it's going to start regrowing again. Mm. So, and then the regrowing of the tumor tissue will start to expand again and she'll have this issue all over again. Okay. So the goal is, and I think that's a great question. And the goal is to really get as much of it out as they can, which they did. And now, radiate right away because that there's actually a space where they extracted the tumor so that they can radiate right down into the areas they weren't able to get to. Mm -hmm. If they wait and the brain does its healing, then there's going to be brain tissue between the tumor and the outside. Mm -hmm. So right now she has a beautiful scar <laughs> and you can see the lines of where they, they do a, a mapping and they send the radiation right to the areas and so they're, they're very hopeful mm -hmm. that they're going to get it all. And then this could be a thing of the past for her. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Any other questions? That's a great question. Okay. And just because I want to draw a distinction between something like MS, um, since we mentioned MS earlier, and uh, a brain injury. So a brain injury uh, like this or a brain tumor, the person is actually on a trajectory of healing, right? So they're gonna get better and better. Whereas with MS or ALS, for example, the symptoms are gonna get worse over time. So we're gonna be looking at two different things. We're looking at Gina to progress and to see, so we can talk about her in terms of progression and how she can heal. And then we can flip it and talk about what, what we do if this was a declining state as well, if you would like, um, so that we can address other, with neurological issues, either the person's gonna be getting better on strokes, a lot of times they're getting better, um, but with uh, other neurological conditions, cer cerebral palsy, they're just gonna stay pretty much at the same level uh, and not get much better, but um, not, get, not decline neurologically. Also, so those I think would be the three differentiating categories here. In this case, let's talk about what, what could we possibly do here? If Gina walked into your, into your space, into your studio, um, what would be your concerns? Just listening to her history, what are some things that come to mind? With the, with the numbness, I would think um, not being able to um, effectively feel what she's doing, uh, mm -hmm. not get, not having any feedback from her body uh, with the numbness, the weakness, and if, mm -hmm. if any pain exists. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So I agree. If there's numbness there, it's really hard to know where your body is in space. Um, so one of the things you might see, like one of the exercises we did early on was get her on the reformer for footwork because I wanted to get her to use, well, we'll talk about that too, but I wanted to get her to use both sides of her leg, body the same, right? And have her start. So footwork's a great place to put somebody because we have so much support for the back and the body and we can focus on the, on the legs and feet. But if somebody has decreased sensation, what might happen when their feet are on the foot bar? They fall off. 
<laughs> exactly. They, they just up. slide off sometimes. Yeah. They crumple up or they slide off. So when I first worked with her and she was weaker and had less sensation, I was actually holding on to her heels mm -hmm. and just approximating them against the foot bar as she moved in and out. And I, and I did both. You could just do the one. Um, I tend to do both because with, um, when somebody has a neurological issue, especially it's coming from the brain, uh, you have your pathway, your corticospinal pathway. It comes from the brain. That's the nerve pathway that goes down into your extremities. And it goes from one side of the brain, it crosses over in the spinal cord and finishes or sends the information to the opposite side of the body uh, from the brain. So her tumor is left-sided. Her dysfunction is all right-sided. Her difficulty is all right-sided. What's interesting though, is we have those pathways on both sides of the brain and some of the fibers don't cross over. So there's a, most of them do, but a few of them don't. And I think, and I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think that's why if you are to, you could try it on yourself too. If you go and point your foot, you end up, if you point one foot by itself, it's a little harder to get a strong point than if you do both feet together, you kind of get this both feet going together, both feet get stronger. It's a co-contraction um, on opposite sides. So with people with neurological dysfunction, a lot of times if they are working the side that's not impacted, it helps the side that is impacted figure out what to do. So if you were to put her on, initially we did just two foot footwork, doing the same thing, both feet doing the same thing, hoping that some of that information would come down from the right side of the brain and stay on the right side of the body. And also that she could feel what's happening on the left foot and have her right foot sort of just follow along for the ride so that we could start recreating in her case, those brain cells. In the case of somebody with MS, it would be pathways, nerve pathways that didn't have enough damaged myelin to prohibit motion yet. So whatever pathway we could get to that muscle, we were going to try and help it get there, right? Get, get the body to do the motion, to ask for that information back up the chain in MS in, in the brain injury would be asking for that information to come from the brain. Okay. So uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Does, um, does she have any on, on the right side, any muscle contracture that she, okay. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, she did not go into any spasming or muscle contractures. So that was lucky. Yes. Now okay. mm -hmm. that does happen when the inhibitory pathway doesn't get the information to inhibit excessive contraction. Okay. So in, in her case, her inhibitory pathways to were okay. She's, they stayed okay. That's not always the case. And in cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. that is, that's why you see so many spas, spasms and muscle contractures in cerebral palsy is because that inhibitory pathway gets shut down or doesn't work. And so the muscles go to, to contract and there's no limit. And so they get stuck in that contraction. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great, great questions though. Yeah, so, um, so one of our concerns, I'm gonna steer myself back because I do get off track too. <laughs> one of our main concerns is gonna be that she doesn't have enough sensation to know where her feet are in space. And we use that example of footwork. Where else would that be a problem with decreased sensation? Big, really obvious thing. Standing. <laughs> Standing, thank you. Standing <laughs> and walking, right? Super obvious. So I think, and, and for me, one of my biggest concerns was that she's able to walk safely and just be mobile safely. Now, this is a mom. She has two kids at home. She's got animals <laughs> at home. Like we need to make sure she's going to be okay um, walking. And in the case of neurological dysfunctions, uh, I think, and again, it depends on if they're in that getting better or if they're going to be in a declining state using assistive devices to help keep somebody safe, I think is a very good idea, especially somebody with, um, is, that's also having mental issues, right? Mental challenges, um, memory issues, uh, spatial issues sometimes. Um, sometimes it affects the eyes, different things can affect the eyes. So 
really keeping them safe and using whatever devices they need to be safe when they're independent, I think is a really great idea too. So we want to make sure that she's not going to trip and fall and that she's, um, can, so we could work on a lot of great things in Pilates. We have a lot of great things that can retrain walking, right? And balance. There's so many exercises that can do that. So that would be something that we could really work on with her. Um, okay. So what things would we have to be careful of in terms of are there really any contraindications for somebody with a brain injury? I would think that not really a, contra a contraindication, but um, when that individual is lying down, sitting, standing, um, making sure that the position of the head is not in a compromised position in any way, shape, or form, uh, you know, putting more pressure on, uh, on an area that um, uh, may cause an issue or problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we call that the dependent position, right? If the head is down, um, there could be a lot more blood pressure to the head. That could be a problem, especially with people who have had bleeds in the brain, which would be strokes. So making sure that there, that there is no contraindication there. And hopefully you would get that information either from the client themselves or from the doctor. Uh, but I would say that anybody who's had any sort of bleeding in the brain, which again, the strokes is one of those a big one, I think for that, just keeping them a little bit at an, and a little bit of an angle with the head up, making sure that's not going dropping below. So leaning back over the barrel or the arc might not be the best bet in this case. Yeah. And that's, I think that's, luckily we don't do like upside down bridges as in yoga and Pilates, but we do some, <laughs> cause that would probably be contraindication. Um, but I think, yeah. And then there is one other thing uh, that is not really a contraindication again, but it's, uh, and, and I talked with Gina a lot about this um, also, is a fatigue. Mm. So the mental fatigue and the need to rest. Now, Gina's a go-getter. She wants to, she, like, she was telling all the doctors, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to be in such good shape. I'm going to blow you all away, kind of a thing. And I'm like, I love that attitude. But the only way you're going to blow people away is if you actually rest um, enough. Because the, again, it, the, it takes so much physical energy to heal uh, from a neurological problem, especially with a brain, brain injury. I worked in a rehab facility for a short while um, as one of my first places that I worked as a physical therapist. And I was struck, there was a young woman in there who must have been not more than 20, maybe a little bit less who had a brain injury and she was one of our patients in the hospital um, and she would have it written on her schedule. Um, she could do, she could be up for two hours at a time without having a half hour rest, nap, sleep. It was only two hours at a time. And then she would have to have at least a half hour rest and then another two hours and then a longer rest. And as the day progressed, the rest, resting time had to progress as well. But I was just struck at how much sleep and rest she actually needed to start having some progress. And as soon as the person fatigues, all the systems start to shut down. So it's not, it's not the same as when we just get tired. Um, we can keep pushing through and mentally we stay pretty, pretty good unless it's sort of this chronic fatigue, right? They can't think straight anymore. And then their body doesn't move right anymore. And it becomes so apparent. So that's the one thing I would really watch for. And we had to evaluate how much time we could actually spend working together at first because she needed so much rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, your, your session may not make it to being an hour long um, if that's what you're used to doing. It may be that you need to do a half hour, maybe more frequently half hours than a full hour, for example, in a day might be too much. So that's one thing I would list as a sort of contraindication. And I think that would apply to most all neurological uh, issues. Yeah. I was thinking right. also maybe um, like less complicated instructions, maybe trying to keep things a little more, more simple and straightforward. 
And also maybe yeah. using touch sometimes is a, can be helpful if you're not sure where, if you say, you know, mm -hmm. move your, move your lower leg and they're thinking, where's my lower leg? <laughs> I can't <laughs> feel it or I'm not sure where it is. Yeah. And thank you. That is an excellent point. So um, we haven't really talked about what do we do in terms of cueing and exercising. And I think you're absolutely right. I think in this case, um, we do a lot of verbal cueing. I do. I'm sure you guys do as instructors do a lot of verbal cueing. I agree. I don't think verbal cueing is necessarily the best path here. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's going to depend on that person and the stage that they're in. Um, I do do a lot of very physical um, work with these people in terms of not pushing them around, but I'm putting my hands on them and I'm just suggesting with my hands that oh, you know, your hips checked out to the side. We need to get that hip underneath. But instead of saying, can you just get up taller on your leg or can you squeeze your glute? I would just put my hand there and say, lift and help them just lift on that leg. Or I bring my, if their knees hyperextending, I'll bring my, my own knee behind them and just put a little pressure behind their knee. So there's less for them to mentally process to get what you need out of the body. They can just feel it and you can help the body go into that position if you're supporting them um, without having to go through the whole translating language into action mm -hmm. process, right? Especially for somebody who's had the brain injury part or that's affecting their brain. Yeah. So I think you're right. Using hands, um, maybe keeping the cues really simple, keeping things to, to being more of a one step, not three step you're, you're going to put your feet in the straps and turn your heels together, toes apart and press out and frog. Like they, they would look at you like, hmm? <laughs> you know, I would probably look at you like that too. And, and I, I don't think I have any, brain injury. but you know, they, they would really, they'd really go hmm? too many steps. Right. So one step at a time, or even just placing them there and say, just push or mm -hmm. just stand or lift or, um, you know, uh, you know, rest your hand here or, you know, just things where you're actually kind of helping them get their body into the right place. I think you're right. You're going to have a lot more success that way. Yeah. So thank you. That's a great, great point. Um, all right. Let me go back and see where we are here. So anything that you would avoid, I think we sort of covered that there's nothing in this case, unless there's some other injury or some other predisposition to something there, then you would avoid something. Um, you want to just avoid situations where they're unsafe. So making sure that they're really safe. Um, I use the poles of the Cadillac a lot to have them just hold on while we do balance work. So they have two hands on and then I'm behind them a lot. So uh, they have two hands on, I have my body right behind them. Most of the time, somebody's not as likely to just fall forward with their hand when they're holding on. So I feel pretty secure. So that's a great place to put somebody if you're unsure about their stability or on the chair with both handles, holding on both handles and you're just behind them. Um, keeping your hands on them is really great because sometimes they don't even know if they can carry their weight or if their knee's going to buckle or, you know, so just being right there so that they, they can feel safe and you feel safe is a great idea. All right, and so in this case, what are some great exercises we could do? Let's focus on her lower body function, dysfunction, meaning that lower leg, the foot not dorsiflexing enough um, and the stumbling. What would be some exercises that you guys would think about doing? I think footwork, of course, um, but then also maybe practicing just picking up the leg. So mm -hmm. to, to prevent the stumbling, um, like some psoas or QL work that kind of helps her to get that motion back. Um, so chair work, but that's gonna be tricky with balance. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also like feet in straps because you can use the, the good leg to help guide what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Feet and straps, I always like to draw this dif differentiation between feet and straps on the reformer and feet and straps on my Cadillac or springboard or the tower. 
Um, do you guys know what the main difference is? Or you can think about it. I'm sure you know what the main difference is between feed and straps up there and feed and straps in the reformer. They're independent. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And on the reformer is a pulley system, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, if one leg's not doing its job, maybe potentially having them on the reformer versus on the Cadillac would help. It mm -hmm. might actually guide if one leg's doing some of the work, the other leg gets to go for the ride and gets to have that motion. And, and this is one of these cases where we're creating motion to try and send information back up the, up the pathways, up to the brain. So this is one of those cases where that could be super helpful versus in orthopedic land. I would never do that. I would, <laughs> I would have them on the springboard, right? Because I want them to see that I don't want one leg doing more work in that case, right? I don't want them to end up twisting their pelvis and getting a, a funky alignment with one leg doing the work. But in this case, that one leg that's doing the work can actually help the other leg do some of the work yeah. and, and find the path. So, so yeah, I agree with all those exercises. Um, and I did, I put her on the chair pretty much right away. Um, the interesting thing is if you have somebody who comes in with that AFO, I had her take it off, but you could, if you were worried about not being able to support them, you could have them start working with it on. Mm -hmm. So that you then you don't have to worry about the knee hyperextending as much as well. Mm -hmm. So that that the intent of that is to keep the ankle and dorsiflexion, but because it comes so high up on the calf, it actually helps the knee not hyperextend mm -hmm. either. And that's a that's a big deal for people who don't have the control at the lower leg. So you could have them work um, with that on at first and see, and then you could just have them holding on with both hands. Um, and trying to see if they can organize and coordinate their motion. Yeah. Any other, what other exercises? There's so many that relate. Um, I, hi, I might hi. try some standing work um, supported though, but um, with the springboard. Mm -hmm. Just, just to you know, help with balance and um, you know, the the rowing and all of that. Yeah. So Standing, some arm work. Support. Yeah. Some arm work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that brings in a whole another level of trunk. Right. Once we start using the arms, we we need the stability in the center of the body, right, to hold us. If we're doing something with our arms and we're standing on our legs, you guys, we don't think about it, right? But somebody who's compromised and who maybe doesn't have, is also their nerves at the trunk are gonna be a little bit compromised. So they may not have as much control here. So using the arms um, while they're standing can help them sort of find control, continue to work the muscles in their, in their core, right? Uh, in a way that's super functional. So that they can apply that to gait, they can apply that to standing, they can apply it to kind of daily activities as well. So yeah, and um, Kim, you're right. So probably standing right behind that person with your hands on them the whole time, but letting them do some arm work uh, there and standing at the springboard would be great. What about balance? Well, I do some some things and I, I did it with a couple of clients this afternoon um, using the um, uh, the tower and setting you know setting the springs pulling down um, uh, and just lifting one knee um, and then the other knee arms coming back up again you know more or less a physical therapy type work which you're working your balance um, and first starting with it um i mean one of one of my late one of the ladies i was working with is like 90 and she can barely get her her feet off the ground doing these but you know the the balance work is really great because she has to engage her core um every time she pulls the arms down every time she lifts a leg up but making sure that the pelvis is staying level and that she's standing tall. She's not sinking into one hip or the other. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and that's great on so many levels, right? Because for appropriate gait, you need to have the ability to stand up tall and have glute medius firing and keeping you in alignment all the way down the body on that side, right? Otherwise you end up, right? Otherwise you can end up with that, what we call the glute medius gait or Trendelenburg gait, where every time they step, the hip drops, the hip drops every time they take weight on that leg. So yes, I, I love that exercise idea. Um, I think you're right. You're challenging balance. You're challenging stability. You're challenging strength. A great idea. One of my favorites is to put the bar of the chair down on the floor, take the springs off and set it down and have them stand on that bar. It seems like such, if you haven't tried that, try it. It's not that easy. <laughs> it's actually quite challenging. And um, especially if you just go balls of feet on, I usually go balls of feet on and zip the legs together and have them just try and stand there and balance. Um, I, we can do calf raises on there too. You can also stand tandem one foot right in front of the other on the bar. So it provides a little bit of instability. Um, and that's one of my, it's safe. I feel safe because they have both poles there too. And then I can be behind them on the side that there's no poles. So I feel like it's really a, quite a safe place to challenge their balance. Um, and I've had athletes on there who can't balance on there at first. So it's, um, it, it seems like it should be so easy, but if you haven't tried it, try it. <laughs> it's a great little, great little mean trick to play. Everybody thinks I'm really nice till they get to know me. And hopefully that's the same <laughs> with you guys. <laughs> what is it? What is it you did? You put them on the, I, I put the foot bar down of the chair on, I took the springs off and just rest the bar down. Oh, the pedal thing, the pedal, the pedal. Okay. The pedal. Okay. Yeah. And then have them stand on it. Oh, okay. It's that uh, it, you don't think you're looking at it. You're like, huh, that looks really easy. I wonder why they're having any trouble at all, but try it for yourself <laughs> and see. And then if they get good at it, you could do a single foot, you know, but, um, but yeah, it's, um, that's a great way to balance and pretty safe as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's another one that, that I also do with my little 90 year old lady. I put a, um, have her standing independently holding on to one of the bars and I'll take a yoga block and put it up against her standing leg and have her take the other foot, say the, the yoga block is up against the, the, the right, the instep of the right foot. I'll have her take mm -hmm. her left foot in back of the block and pick it up and over mm -hmm. the block so that she's yeah. stepping forward and back. Um, right. but focusing on lifting the leg over the block rather than sliding it out to the side and around. So she's, so she can develop that strength in the quad. So she's not doing a shuffle. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. That, that's, 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 that can also be done on the BOSU ball as well. So mm -hmm. for more mm -hmm. athletic people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, we're looking at balance. We're looking at gait patterns and getting the legs to lift up and over. Um, what about foot strength? So, yeah. I would suggest you to, um, I'll be standing up with a, a ball, like um, a massage ball depending on the strength of the, the, the person and what we, we want to try to uh, work on today. Mm -hmm. And just be standing up in the, um, I don't know the term in English, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> the, like the V-shape uh, yeah. foot on on floor and just uh, rise up with the ball between the ankles. Yeah. So it just, um, it does uh, a good work on the foot and under the foot as well with the fascia and everything and that goes to the other legs and the calves as well yeah yes i love that exercise and i love it because it makes it so that the ankles can't do whoop out to the side right they've got to keep the ankles in alignment um, and that connects all the way up inner thighs pelvic floor belly and out the head so yeah, that's a lovely exercise. Yeah. Yeah. For foot strength, there's a couple of things that I do is um, uh, I'll put a towel on the floor and have them use their toes 
to grab the towel or try to pick the towel up. And so they're, they're working that entire foot. Um, I'll do, you know, heel lower and lift, but I'll also use um, uh, the, uh, I've got one of um, one of Joe's toe thingies where the, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the strap with the, um, or straps with spring in between. And so you're <laughs> strengthening that way. Excuse my dog. Um, <laughs> Eight, eight pounds of terror. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, just, it's just, you know, things like that, you know, and having, the, uh, taking a, a therapy band and doing like four planes of motion, like pushing the band away, pulling the band toward, uh, toward them, um, uh, uh, resisting the band in, resisting the band out. Right. right. So ankle foot strengthening. Yeah. Yes. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I, and I think that's a great idea. Uh, the reason I said, what about the foot too? Is we need that to stand on obviously, but the other thing about the foot is that, and the fingers hands is that they're really in the periphery, right? So a lot of times that's the first place where there's function loss is a way out in the extremities. Um, and sometimes it's the last thing to get the function back. So um, that's just something to keep in mind is looking for foot strength is a great cue. And you guys just listed a whole bunch of exercises that would be excellent for strengthening the feet. So you've got an, an enormous amount of tools in your toolbox that you could use here. So I wanted in just the last few minutes here to as time's going, going by so fast, um, I wanted to just touch on a little bit about, we mentioned MS. I think some, I think Chris, you said you're seeing some yes. people with MS. Yes. Um, there is a contraindication specific to MS and that is um, overheating. So yes. people, people with MS should not be exercising in a hot environment. They really need to keep their body temperature lower. It seems to really progress the disease with MS, um, the disease process with MS when they're overheated. Um, and we mentioned at the very beginning that we are talking in a brain injury. We're talking about like with Gina in this case study that I shared her, her progression is in it, the direction of healing. And that would be true again, brain injuries, strokes, um, peripheral nerve injuries. Those would all be kind of a progression towards healing. So our goal is climbing up a mountain and I'm going to issue that's her goal. I love that goal for her. And so that's what we're going to keep working towards. And Every time she has a little setback, we're just going to keep strengthening in the watching out for fatigue and keep helping her progress. In the case of MS, in the case of ALS, in the case of um, other, there's other tons of other neurological syndromes where people are going to be in a declining direction. We have to take into consideration what we're doing now and what it's going to look like down the road. So preparing them um, physically for what's happening, but not overdoing. So for example, with ALS and in the later stages of MS, we need to be careful not to overdo the muscle work because if the muscle fibers tear, there's no regenerating anymore happening, right? The, they're not going to be able to rebuild. So being really cognizant about how getting feedback from your client, they shouldn't be sore with MS and ALS. They really should not be sore after a session with you. They should be able to leave the session and go home and feel great the next day, not feel like they need to uh, rest and um, catch up the next day so that they're, because their bodies won't really have a chance to rebuild. It's not, it's totally different than sort of our orthopedic model of breakdown a little bit a little bit of sore muscles. We're like, oh yeah, I got a little, I did a great ab workout. I got a little sore. That's great in the orthopedic realm, in the neurological realm when we have these declining syndromes, it's not the right approach. Yeah, so really making sure that they are not sore, not hurting afterwards um, so that they can fully function. Plus we don't wanna, we wanna strengthen them. We wanna create safety and stability for them but we also don't wanna take away function from their daily life tasks. So it has to be the right amount of time. Sometimes again, going maybe it's maybe an hour is too long later down the road, maybe half hour is gonna be enough because they have 
they have to be able to get themselves up out of bed to the bathroom to make their food, to um, clean their house, to go grocery shopping. Like that could be a big event for somebody. So making sure that they're still able to do all their functions um, and, and that we're not taking up all their energy and then they can't do the rest of the things they need to do. So having them journal or at least mentally journal and really checking in verbally with them every time they come in um, is really important, I think, as well. I know that this is not enough information to know everything, but um, hopefully just something to get your minds going around a little bit and thinking a little bit. And then um, you're always welcome to ask questions or send questions my way for these case studies. Um, basically, we try and do a new case study every week on a different topic. Um, and if you have a case study that you wanna present, you can send it to me um, ahead of time and I will be happy to try and present uh, different case studies that are not mine that are one of yours. If, if, um, and then we can just kind of talk about it, round table about it and get people to input so that we can get better treatment for everybody, everybody's clients. So. And um, you're welcome. And if you have questions that I don't know the answer to, I'll try and find you the answer. And then we try, I have already scheduled, I believe, I have to check my dates, March and April, the first Thursday of the month, I have two different doctors coming in to talk about different things. One is going to talk about, I think, shoulder and one is going to talk about hip. Um, so they, they'll be upcoming. We'll post when those are coming. But if you know people um, who are expert in their field and would like to share, um, I'm always looking for other people who want to share um, their expertise with us. So um, just if you want to send them my, my information, or that would be great. Thank you. All right. You're thank welcome. You very much. It was Have, very enjoyable. Yes, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon, evening.